Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I'll start with some announcements for the week. First of all, we're just about three or four weeks from the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course starting, which is taught by an amazing group of instructors, John McDougall, Neil Barnard, uh, Dr. Ralph Moss from CancerDecisions.com. I don't know if you guys know, Dr. Elsistan's part of that group, but it's live and interactive. You're actually in a live interactive teleconference with these amazing people, learning from them about all kinds of things ranging from from dietary protocols to uh, information about women's health and diagnostic testing and, and uh, all kinds of things, cancer treatment, that uh, providers and lay people both need to know. So um, if you're a doctor, nurse, or a dietitian, you can get 39 continuing education hours. So look into it. At least take a look at what it's all about. Um, we now have, and I said this last week, go to our website if you haven't done it and watch the two new videos. One is for individuals who are interested in knowing more about this informed decision-making um, program that we offer here. And uh, the other is for health providers to talk about career opportunities in the type of work that we're doing, either on your own or with us. We have some great programs you should really look at, but the general concepts in these videos will help you regardless if you ever contact us. So go watch those, wellnessforum.com. Um, this month I'm covering for Advanced Study, The Myth of Mental Illness by Tom Saws. Uh, he died a couple years ago, but he's a he was a psychiatrist who spoke out against uh, the drugging of patients and, and involuntary commitment. And um, the book has surprised me because there's so much more in it other than just a commentary on psychiatry. Uh, so we barely got through the first section in two hours uh, last night when I was with my class. But uh, there's another class left. We have the first one recorded. This will fascinate you, and it's a hard book to read, so trust me, you'd rather have me explain it to you than try and plow through it on yourself, on, on your own. So anyway, those are some things going on. Summer semester at the Wellness Farm Institute starts soon. We offer some excellent classes like maternal and pediatric uh, nutrition, cardiovascular health and nutrition. So uh, check things out. And if you're not really sure what you should do, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com, and we can just set up a time to talk about them on the phone, all right? So let's get into some content now. According to a recent study, women who eat more fruits and vegetables when they're younger have a lower risk of plaque buildup in their arteries when they're older. And the data were taken from an ongoing study that's looking at how cardiovascular disease develops through an entire lifetime. The researchers looked at fruit and vegetable intake for women in their 20s and then compared that intake with the development of coronary artery disease in their 40s, which was measured by uh, coronary artery calcification. So scans were used to detect that. The researchers reported that women who ate the most fruits and vegetables, eight to nine servings a day, were 40% less likely to have calcified plaque in their arteries than women who only ate three to four servings of fruits and vegetables every day. The association between fruit and vegetable intake and coronary calcification held true even after looking at current dietary patterns and other lifestyle habits and um, things like that. The study illustrates several important points. First of all, this isn't surprising, fruit and vegetable intake matters and the effect is dose dependent. More produce intake means more health protection and the, early good the earlier that good diets and good habits are formed, the better protection you get. Uh, of course, the best case scenario is we start with breastfeeding as soon as the infant enters the world and we continue with good feeding habits when we introduce foods and all the way through adolescence and into adulthoods. And unfortunately, uh, that's really not what ends up happening in, in mo with most people. But the lead author wrote, and I think this says it all, these findings confirm the concept that plaque development is a lifelong process and that process can be slowed down with a healthful diet at a young age. This is often when dietary habits are established, so there is value in learning how the choices we make early in life have lifelong benefits. And so just as we know that when we work with kids to make sure they get good grades in school, and they learn good manners and behavioral parameters. We know that's a good idea because it benefits them in adulthood. So does the diet. We've got to keep talking about this and getting people to pay more attention to it. All right, so I've been talking a lot about diagnostic testing, and, um, and there are good reasons for it because patients are being told to have more and more tests, and the sales pitch is almost always the same. And it is a sales pitch, by the way. So it goes something like this. 
If we find out about all of your diseases early, you'll be better off. You'll have fewer complications, you'll have better health, you'll live longer. In the case of cancer screening, people are told cancer screenings can save your life because you could die of cancer. Well, the problem is that for almost all screening tests, and there are some notorious exceptions, the promises just aren't true. Early detection doesn't result in better outcomes for most people most of the time. And a lot of times what happens is we take healthy people and we turn them into worried well people because some clinical abnormality has been detected. And um, uh, they're labeled as diseased and then they're encouraged to come in for more testing and sometimes to take drugs and have procedures. And it's the medical mill. People get sucked into the medical mill and it's a problem. Now there seems to be some growing recognition that all of this testing is not so good and much of it is done by the way in conjunction with the annual exam which more and more people are speaking out against and that more and more people that includes medical doctors who are saying it's not a good idea. One of the primary dangers of this annual exam is that sometimes tests are done that patients aren't even aware of and two good examples are a doctor takes a blood draw and requests the, the um, uh, lab to give him a reading for a prostate specific antigen or for thyroid stimulating hormone and the patient doesn't even know that this has happened, all right? So the US Preventive Services Task Force um, is fortunately taking the lead at looking at outcomes to determine the viability of many medical practices and lately they've been issuing a lot of encouraging reports, I think discouraging, they're, they're encouraging rather, they're saying things like we should not test asymptomatic people for vitamin D status or for uh, thyroid dysfunction. Uh, they've also just come out with a report that says that screening for type 2 diabetes is useless too. The rationale for testing for type 2 diabetes has always been that you're going to identify things like impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance early in order to prevent the onset of full-blown diabetes. So the task force looked at Cochrane databases, Medline, and previous reports that they put together. And here were the bottom, here's the bottom line. In two trials, there was no difference in mortality at 10 years between people who were screened and those not screened for type 2 diabetes. 16 trials showed that treatment for impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose delayed the onset of diabetes, but it didn't prevent it. And, almost, and most studies looking at treatment for either of those things found that the treatment did not reduce all-cause mortality or mortality from cardiovascular disease. That's one of the concerns is that if you can identify these issues early, you might reduce the risk of dying of cardiovascular disease, which is what kills most diabetics. One trial did show that lifestyle changes decreased the risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality after 23 years. Multifactorial interventions and aggressive glucose control with drugs were useless for reducing mortality, and the results of aggressive treatment for blood pressure were inconsistent, in other words, also useless. And so what we really have is that when you get tested early for fasting glucose um, impairment, uh, decreased glucose tolerance, what happens is you're labeled as a patient and you're placed on metformin to prevent you from later developing diabetes so you can be placed on metformin. Did that sound weird to any of you? That's medicine today. So just to summarize here, there's no benefit associated with testing glucose levels in the general population or treating abnormalities discovered through this testing process. The best that a patient can uh, hope to achieve uh, is to develop full-blown diabetes a little bit later than he normally or she normally would have developed it. That's really not a very good outcome. Uh, the only thing that was found to be beneficial was lifestyle modifications, surprise, surprise, and surprise, surprise, only one study looked at that. Much more interested in looking at the effect of drugs. Now, when I talk about the uselessness of testing, people say, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, if I'm not gonna find out about my diseases early. Well, you know, we know what causes these things, and so here's what you do. The leading causes of type 2 diabetes are obesity, inactivity, poor diet, and smoking. So here's the deal. If you're overweight, let us help you lose weight. Uh, if you are inactive, how about you start moving? If you're not eating a health-promoting diet, we can help you with that. And if you're smoking, stop that, all right? It's that simple. You know, sometimes people tell you, yeah, do you think it's really that simple? Yeah, it's that simple. Now, we're not going to do a billion dollars worth of this eat right and exercise and that sort of thing, but for the patient, the simplest strategy is what I just described. doesn't cost any money. Actually, it saves you money because grocery bills are less. 
and then you really do not end up with diabetes, uh, not now and not later. All right, so that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you again on Thursday.